All right, welcome everyone to this session uh, this evening. We've got uh, Dennis Sunny here to really run us through creating your holistic agile framework tailored to your business context. Uh, please welcome Dennis Sunny. Hello, hello everyone. Um, yeah, I will um, do some uh, short introduction uh, about myself very shortly. Just um, I'm, I'm making sure that everyone understands how we are going to uh, do this session today, okay? Um, I will share my screen, but I encourage you to join us in Mural. Uh, it should be possible for you even without uh, joining Mural, without uh, logging into the account. Uh, at this moment, I believe that you, when you join, uh, you will be able to do almost nothing. Um, I hope so, because I want to moderate uh, this whole session, so I will summon everyone, and I would like to uh, lock uh, the screen for everyone so that you could see only what I can see. Then we go uh, efficiently, okay? So give me a second, I will do it. So first I release everyone, I summon everyone, and take control. Okay, so this session is uh, to um, discuss the high-level concept of creating your own holistic agile framework tailored for the business context. Let me be open and honest with you. Please don't expect that I will tell you everything so that you are fully equipped with, oh, okay, this is everything needed, <laughs> so I go and do it, yeah? Of course, we have the whole uh, two-day session uh, designed for this, I mean, the training, and I, I must say that that is quite intense training within two days to learn that. So here I will try to touch the most critical part of that. Uh, well, essentially one of the most uh, important topics from the whole training. And uh, uh, I, I hope that in the end of this session, uh, you will have uh, an idea. Ah, okay, now I see something really important for me where I can start. Okay, so I hope that it will be the result of this session. So a uh, couple of words about me very quickly. So yeah, I'm a trainer consultant. I'm focusing on adaptive organizations tailored for business. Uh, I have 20 years in banking, fintech, digital, auto automotive industries. Big names are here. You can see these shields. Uh, former career of mine is in um, software development, project management. I was head of project management office and uh, I actually changed after that to agile uh, related um, uh, functions. I was a scrum master, agile coach. Um, geography wise, I was born in uh, Ukraine. Well, that time it was USSR. <laughs> I am quite old already. And I uh, um, started a career in Russia seven years ago, moved to European Union. And right now I'm in Portugal. By the way, maybe next year I will come and move to Australia. I hope so, but let's see. Um, well, anyways, if you have any questions about my personality, you can ask afterwards, okay? Um, the learning resources, of course, already you can find everything uh, posted or published. For instance, we have an amazing book, uh, Creating Agile Organizations. You can just um, order it from Amazon or other sources. Uh, we also have kind of a uh, um, quintessence of that <laughs> distilled into this um, key, CAO guide and even shorter version uh, published uh, by uh, CAO and scrum.org executive overview. So you can uh, find all of these resources from this amazing site, creating agileorganizations.com. Okay. By the way, don't try to, yeah, it's it's a little bit not that much useful to try to open links from this slide. So we will share all the links after the session so you can uh, use them afterwards. So it's just introduction. And of course, uh, I, I must say that uh, I'm coming to Sydney uh, this August, September to deliver uh, two trainings uh, on this topic, but of course, much more, much deeper and uh, broader uh, to equip you, really equip you with everything needed to do, create agile organizations. Uh, it will be Sydney, uh, options for weekend and weekdays. So again, all the links will be provided afterwards. Now, what are we going to have in terms of the steps for this session? First, we will look at the problems 
problems with frameworks. Well, we're not speaking about building a framework. So what, what, what the heck then is, why do we need to build any new frameworks? Uh, just because something's wrong. Uh, then what are the root causes of that? And ultimately, what's the systemic approach offered by creating agile organizations? I will start, uh, of course, first we will look into the problems. The problems are, we can look at them from different ang angles. Uh, you can find various types of uh, these statistics. I will go quite quickly because I believe that this audience, uh, this amazing society is already quite aware about all these problems, right? So employee engagement, it's, it, it's, it's awful right now. <laughs> I just look at this number. 44% of employees around the world have huge stress. Yeah, I, I, I believe so, because I had it uh, when I was not in, in, an independent <laughs> consultant. I had that. Uh, so in these circumstances, uh, what do you expect that people engage? <laughs> no, of course. Next. Um, Speaking about uh, these big names of uh, consulting companies, McKinsey, BCG, et cetera, well, they believe that uh, from 70 to 95% of GL transformation, oh, I believe that probably closer to 100, but I'm not that big name to, uh, to evaluate. Okay, so anyways, this is the reality of our, nowadays. Another interesting statistic from my perspective, the state of agile, they discovered that, uh, and that was the previous year, they discovered that that was 12% uh, of all uh, respondents uh, stated that they uh, created their own enterprise agile framework, whatever it is, but that is quite interesting, yeah? Um, and before, that was not the case. So the trend is, is in place. But why this uh, happens? Um, I trust you can give much more reasons, uh, much more problems associated with uh, implemented frameworks in current organizations. I just give some of those. So dependencies are everywhere. Coordination effort, huge. And unfortunately, even despite the fact that it's huge, the effectiveness of this coordination is very low. Uh, it, it happens that these dependencies are between teams, uh, within teams, between departments at all levels. Uh, responsibilities and goals are conflicting. These, uh, again, in different, uh, from different angles between different uh, organizational units. Uh, when you speak to, well, I speak to normally the top management and they tell me that, hey, Denise, our overall assumption is that we are very slow especially compared to competitors. Everyone thinks that the competitors run much uh, in front of them. Um, and also in other aspects, money-wise, it looks like we are investing more and more and more and we get less and less and less from there. Yeah? So I would like to know actually, uh, th these guys, can you please share with me, do you have the same or similar feelings um, like too slow um, value delivery or um, black hole for budgets. If you have, um, probably you can uh, just give a like or yeah, signalize somehow. Yeah. Yeah, impressive, yeah. <laughs> yeah, th th this happens all around the world. And uh, uh, quite interesting, you know, because this is, this is something that we are developing. We are building, creating, and we are ending with this, unfortunately. Okay. Now let's be a little bit more precise because, well, of course, uh, every specific company has its own uh, problems, but let's make it quick. Of course, I want you to focus from your other tasks. So what are your uh, own concerns about agile transformations? I provided some examples. You can uh, put, uh, move these uh, stars. Give me a second. I will enable you to do this because I uh, locked you guys. Give me a second. So now you can do. So please move the stars in, uh, next to those um, problems if, if you share uh, the same. Or maybe you have something else in mind. Then for, for that, you have uh, those cards in the bottom. You can just leave them uh, where they are and just put some words so that uh, everyone afterwards, you will have uh, access to this board. You can uh, look what are the problems of others. 
probably I will set a timer, say for one minute, yeah. Looking at this, I always feel pain. I feel I share this pain. <laughs> It's like, you know, like a club of anonymous uh, victims of EGL frameworks. <laughs> okay. Maybe not necessarily EGL frameworks, but their fits to the organizations and uh, business strategies. All right, thank you. That is that, that that is awesome and quite impressive. And I suggest you all uh, again. You will have the link uh, access. We will share all these uh, cards that you put here in words, so that it is not missing. Uh, thank you very much, and quite interesting to to read that. Yeah. So here it is. I'm just zooming in a little. Management does not understand the uh, AGL principles, and the respectively acts. I assume right. <laughs> Uh, there is a lot of focus on doing agile, yeah. Insufficient investment in people development, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dependencies too hard to manage, yeah, absolutely. Uh, culture policies, incentives, enablers aren't aligned. Amazing. I believe that we will touch quite a lot of this uh, in this session. All right. Thank you very much. Let's move on. And before that, let me again look. Uh, you on me? Just give me a second. All right. Okay. Some technical issues. I cannot lock you, but I will just ask you. Could you please just um relax and not touch anything uh, until I tell you, okay? Because something is not locked here on this board. All right, let's move on. Um, so concerns here. And the next stage for us is to look at the root causes, all right? By the way, tell me if you can see how the slides are changing. Do you see it? All right, cool. So I will use this definition of agility. Of course, everyone can uh, uh, improve it for sure from their own angle, but just to be on the same page for this session, when I speak about agility, I will look, I will keep this in mind. This is uh, given by uh, uh, Mike Biddle, and that was for business agility. I don't differentiate, honestly, for me, whatever we are doing anyways for the business. So the ability to adapt quickly, and effectively to all forms of change to deliver maximum value in customer experience. And as you can see, I highlighted just two parts, uh, two uh, main um, parts of this, adapt and all forms of change. Why? Because in the uh, uh, following uh, uh, slides, on the following slides, I will use more adaptability, just to not mix with uh, different types of agility, um, meant in different frameworks, for example. So I will speak about uh, agility, meaning adaptability for value maximization. And those forms of change, different forms of change can uh, be in place. Maybe some of those are not relevant for you, but um, different organizations have different drivers for changes and different changes in place require different types of adaptability. Unfortunately, I discovered that even speaking to uh, other consultants and trainers, we're speaking about uh, adaptability, but mean completely different types of adaptability. What are those? Just to be on the same page. Uh, again, uh, you can call these differently, but I call them product or service adaptability and organizational adaptability. Inside, well, uh, even within the product or service adaptability, I differentiate 
I call it value stream adaptability and cross value stream adaptability. Meaning that, for example, let's let's start with the lowest level of this scale. Understanding of customer needs can change. I'm, I'm not saying the customer needs, maybe they don't change, but we learn something and we understand it better and it changes uh, something that we understand how we can address those needs. Also, understanding of customer agnostic business needs. Sometimes we just discover that there are, let's call it non-functional requirements, right? We discover that uh, we need to increase the changeability of our code. Speaking about software development, for example. Yeah, guys, I will give uh, quite a lot of examples exactly from software development because I'm predominantly from this um, domain. So what those drivers uh, lead to, they lead to probably changing uh, design requirements, uh, functional solutions, technical solutions, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just giving some most common examples. Uh, that happens even within uh, the development of one simple uh, feature, probably. Yeah? Then when it comes to cross-value stream adaptability, we may discover that our competitors make some successful moves, launching some new features or even some um, sub products or products uh, on the market. Uh, some new regulations come up and that requires completely different focus within our products or services. Industry standards may change. So what it means? It means that so far we worked on one part or aspect of, of our product and we know it quite well, but now all our resources probably would need to focus on something else that is of higher value. Yeah, so we need to be adaptable uh, to changing priorities between features or product parts or uh, service parts. Even at the bigger scale, our organization might need adaptability because, yeah, markets change. You see, even uh, five or 10 years ago, I could not even imagine how quickly development of new technologies, of new products, of new um, domains, business domains uh, happen. And now it's this is reality. So market changes quite quickly, and geopolitical circumstances may change. You might discover that your company needs business model to change, strategy strategy to change, or just developing new products and services while just conserving the existing ones. So what it means? It means that your organization need to be capable of reasonably quickly adapt and be capable of yeah, delivering business value in new circumstances. So I hope that in general, I outlined the uh, uh, mm, different angles from which you can look at the adaptability. Now, adaptability is essentially the organizational capability, let's put it this way, because of course, adaptability is one of many. And uh, I remind you that uh, Rowan will uh, have a session about the organizational capabilities. So you can find that your organization needs much more than just adaptability, something specific to your business context. But uh, to understand this conceptually, we need to understand the um, whole organizational system and its context. And we need to understand where is the place of uh, for adaptability. I will uh, provide this uh, example based on the submarine model of organizational system thinking, which is um, a, a derivative from the iceberg model, if you know, for system thinking. So um, outputs are the um, uh, source for outcomes. Of course, on the top, we have something that business is uh, created for some business outcomes. Uh, and those are result of uh, producing some outputs, simple. But what else? That is um, um, driven by those behavioral and process patterns that are cultivated within your organization. In important to note that your outcomes and outputs are influenceable. But you cannot always uh, just guarantee that whatever you put, it, it is taken as is, right? Maybe you produce some amazing features of, or products that you like, but your customers or your markets, they don't need it. Or maybe your competitors already uh, provided something more important. So it's influenceable, not uh, really uh, controllable by organizations. On the other hand, behavioral and process patterns 
uh, here is the place for culture, if you want. Yeah, and I believe that you heard this saying uh, by Peter Drucker: "Culture is strategy for breakfast." So this is exactly it. Um, from this layer of behavioral and process patterns, uh, you have the e input impact on the outputs and respectively outcomes. But even further down, you will discover that there is something that drives the cultural shift and respectively creation of those behavioral and process patterns. This is the organizational design. Uh, structure drives culture. This is another saying now from uh, Craig Larman. And if we consider uh, exactly the organizational capabilities, including adaptability, then it is residing uh, at the level of cultivable. You cannot change it directly. And why I differentiate it from uh, frameworks just because whatever is a framework, it's about organizational design. It's not about the behavioral and product patterns. The intent is to create those behavioral and process patterns, to create those organizational capabilities, but you cannot directly change it. Whatever you do is those organizational elements which drives the creation of respective organizational capabilities. So now let's move a little bit further. Okay. And uh, another model uh, to explain uh, the concept of creating a gel organization, the STAR model by Jay Galbraith. I admire this model. This is very simple. And uh, uh, the main points of it are the organizational design is much more than just low level structures and processes where normally we find our gel frameworks. Different strategies lead to different structures, and ultimately all elements are interdependent and complement each other. So if you want to unfold the full potential of your company and make it agile if you want, then you need to achieve the synergy of all of these elements. And let's consider a very quick example. Uh, a company uh, wants to win the biggest market share through being first with innovative features that customers love. Yeah, this is their strategic intent. And therefore, they believe that they need some agile framework, whatever it is, okay? Now what happens? Uh, if you look inside this company further or beyond teams, then you will discover that, in the, th this is a real example, of one of uh, my clients, yeah? They have the project-based accountability of management and also process-wise, they um, uh, approve budgets based on projects annually, of course. But even looking further, you will find it that um, they hire narrow specialists who never worked with true teamwork. They uh, force narrow specialization because their career, um, uh, career paths are uh, bind to the narrow specialization and also compensation, careers. They depend on individual achievements, visibility to management, political gaming, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what does it mean? It means that all of those elements actually work probably against what a GL framework is designed for. This is called, give me a second. This is called inconsistent organizational design. If the uh, light gray elements like a gel uh, framework are consistent with our strategic intent, then others are not consistent or vice versa. But still, you have all those consequences. You have a lot of conflicts exactly because of conflicting elements of organizational design. Um, quick statement from my side, I believe just from, from the experience of mine and my network that inconsistent organizational design leads to weak organizational capabilities to overcome the major challenges towards strategic goals. And this is the most common root cause of weak outcomes of AGL adoptions. Well, I would add that this is the most common root cause of all uh, ineffective organizations in general. So, uh, and finally, just to come closer to these frameworks, and what we want to overcome is what is the coverage uh, in terms of the organizational design um, by those frameworks, yeah? 
So first of all, uh, speaking of the elements, uh, people, which stands for skills, mindsets uh, that are uh, acquired and developed uh, within the uh, organization, as well as reward systems, well, agile frameworks do say nothing about this. It, it, best case, when you can find some recommendations, but you know, they are, when somebody recommends, you just, okay, thank you and goodbye. Um, and only the framework is taken. Structures and processes. Okay, well, maybe here. Uh, if you look at the uh, structures and processes from the perspective of product-related aspects, then yes, of course, those frameworks address at least low-level aspects like team level, uh, or sometimes touch uh, higher level, like portfolio level, etc. cetera. Um, however, when it comes to line management, that almost no frameworks, um, with some exceptions, they give anything in their uh, prescriptions about how line management should be organized. Speaking about other functions, this is even worse. Yeah? But still, those other functions they um, they have a, a great impact on the way people think and behave uh, because that, that is also part of the organizational design. So now coming to the approach that we offer to overcome uh, those um, challenges. So first, uh, we suggest learning and applying system thinking. And important, let me let me let me make it just. Uh, clear statement here that uh, right now I see that quite many uh, consultants and uh, um, frameworks, no, new frameworks, they declare that, yeah, system thinking is here. Everything is um, uh, based on system thinking. Um, what I would like to say about uh, other method is that the method itself is the system thinking. So everything that uh, we do in, in the classroom is based on system thinking. We just use system thinking for everything. Yeah, uh, Without it, it does not make any sense. And uh, ultimately, the system thinking was the uh, first before even the idea of any approach here. So why this is so important? Because organizations are really the complex systems, social systems, and uh, they do not have some good or bad elements because it depends on the point of view. For instance, this one. Um, project-based accountability of management. It can be good if you want stable and narrow focus, but still, simultaneously, it can be bad if you want adaptability to changing business needs and priorities. The same organizational solution can be simultaneously good and bad depending on the perspective. Another simple, uh, similar example here, narrow specialization can be good for deep expertise, but bad for adaptability. What I'm trying to say is that inconsistent organizational designs are the direct consequence of lacking system optimization goals. Yes, of course, the um, field of knowledge about the organizational design is well um, uh, educated right now, well uh, established. But unfortunately, uh, nobody appreciates, well, not nobody, but quite few um, um, schools really educate about organizations as systems, and every system has its optimization goal or uh, the purpose, if you want. So uh, we build everything in this um, approach of creating agile organizations exactly based on the goal optimization for uh, system optimization goals uh, for our organizations. That provides a single perspective, the North Star for all organizational decisions. Literally, the whole idea is this. The top management declares the optimization goals and all the organizational solutions must be uh, aligned or if you want put in consistency with those optimization goals. Um, Qu uh, quite simple explanation how it works in practice based on the previous example. So you remember that there was this agile framework and other uh, organizational elements not really consistent uh, between them. Uh, once the company, uh, my, my client, they put the optimization goal in the center, they wanted high product adaptability and high value stream adaptability. Well, essentially that was high cross value stream and high value stream adaptability. So once they identified this, they 
clearly saw that the EGL framework that they choose was mostly, well, with some tweaks, mostly uh, consistent with that intent. But when it came to those other elements, yes, uh, the result was that they were inconsistent. Moreover, this is not only about, yeah, okay, we have a problem, but the solution too. Uh, they found their um, they they found alternative for their existing organizational solutions, which were consistent with their um, optimization goals. I'm not saying that these are good or bad, but still, this is exactly the idea of building around the optimization goal. So um, I'm just giving. <laughs> That is, that, that is very complex. I'm not going to go through this, but this is the exact uh, examples of those um, diagrams and thinking process. Guys, organizational systems are quite complex. Yeah, So that is like architecture. So you can expect that you, you might need to end up with some quite um, thorough uh, learning your, of your organization. And uh, this enables you to have uh, shared understanding between management and all the other involved uh, people about why are we choosing one or another organizational solution. On this example, on the left here, we have their findings. Um, and you, you see these red arrows um, representing um, uh, inconsistent uh, cause-effect relations. Those uh, worked against uh, the optimization goals that they specified, those uh, in purple. And uh, uh, the second one shows the result. So that was their um, modeling of the consequences. So against this model, after the changes were implemented, uh, they checked whether it worked exactly as they uh, expected. Well, of course, not necessarily that everything worked exactly this way, but still that provided them um, visual representation of their shared shared understanding. So uh, you can use any different uh, approaches, of course. I'm just uh, sharing uh, what I personally uh, use in my practice. Um, just to sum up what we spoke about so far. Organizational design, yes, it consists of different elements, but most important that you need to organize them around the, your optimization goals. And those optimization goals must be consistent with your uh, strategy. But honestly, well, how exactly, Dennis, are you going to ensure that your optimization goals are consistent with your strategy? Strategies are different. And here we have a very useful uh, tool. We call it st st strategic fo foci. Um, just because this is exactly uh, different focus areas of different companies, even with uh, completely different strategies. You can always group uh, those strategies in those um, st strategic foci. For example, here on this slide, you can see customer-centric organization example, which is continuously developing custom solutions for their VIP clients, for example. Um, so they want to win and maintain long-term partnership with their clients. And the main challenge in their way, they believe that it is in uh, the fact that their clients might leave because the solutions do not really bring actual value, although they deliver uh, according to requirements. So they discover that uh, requirements is good, but they need to uh, maximize the speed of learning and solving actual customer problems. That was their uh, solution, their decision about the desired um, organizational capabilities or optimization goals. One of those, yeah, you can set uh, several. Another uh, option uh, that you can also um, uh, associate your company with, uh, product or market centric. Sometimes uh, companies develop some products or provide services to mass market. You don't know exactly your customers, but there is a huge number of those around, like banks, for example, and uh, um, for instance, retail banks, yeah? And uh, um, they need to maximize share. Well, sometimes not share, but uh, this is example of, for my practice. Maximize share on a highly competitive market of continuously improved products. 
So this is not like uh, we have this product and we sell it. Yeah, we need to develop it uh, further and further to keep up with our competitors. So the competitors might win clients uh, because they are much more innovative as, us, as we, and uh, um, they provide these innovative services to, to the clients. Also, our competitors might be faster reacting to market changes. And therefore, in order to um, address these challenges, they decided on maximizing speed of learning actual market needs and delivering most valuable products. So also, well, uh, there could be many more. I just provide one because uh, those three uh, strategic foci, uh, foci are the most common um, um, that you can find. Operation-centric. So this is something that normally you see when a company has stable products or services, they don't need to develop them further, but they uh, want to provide better offering price-wise with the same quality, for example. yeah. So the main challenges for them is that they might have too expensive operations. And on the other hand, they might experience um, um, changing uh, volumes in supply and demand. So their, their main uh, focus would be on continuous optimization of cost, effect, cost efficiency while adapting to volume variability. That is also, well, uh, if you think about this, there's some adaptability in it, right? Uh, adapting to volumes variability. But you actually can find even much more going deeper inside uh, this uh, cost efficiency optimization. So um, how does it really help us? Based on um, differentiating between those uh, foci, you can identify uh, what it gives you the idea where you can find those challenges for your specific business model, for your specific company. And uh, you can, again, this is just example, but it can help you to find the organizational capabilities that might be necessary for you to uh, overcome those uh, challenges and maximize your company's pro uh, progress towards uh, strategic goals. That is about the organizational optimization goals. Important that, I, I don't know, but uh, I think that you need to know um, about the S-curve of innovation, right? Uh, product services, they normally start with some uh, invention, they experience some growth, and at some point uh, they go into maintenance unless they redefine their products and services. So in this case, you might discover that at the first stage, you probably need more customer centricity. If you, for instance, launch your product for just a couple of uh, your first adopters, but with time, you have more and more clients and you probably switch to product centricity. In the end, you don't need to develop this product or service. Then probably operation centricity uh, is your uh, focus area. And all of those need different optimization goals and different organizational solutions, different organizations. Uh, by the way, uh, of course, you know that at some point you can reinvent your uh, product or service. So again, uh, probably different stages will need different uh, strategic focuses. Please tell me if it's uh, too zoomed out for you. Is it okay? All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what are the steps that we suggest uh, in the creating agile organizations? Always start with your strategy. Understand what is the uh, strategic focus and also identify your major challenges in the way towards your strategy. Then uh, you are in a position to define your organizational capabilities necessary, the essence that is needed for you to develop in your organization to effectively overcome those challenges. This is like I showed here on this example in the bottom, yeah? And that gives you the um, opportunity to set your optimization goals, which are necessary to then select all organizational solutions in all the aspects of structures, process, rewards, and people. And that is, of course, the, the main part, <laughs> the biggest uh, effort-wise. 
However, you still can ensure that everything is uh, aligned to a single purpose. Um, broader uh, looking at the uh, approach after we define these um, organizational capabilities, we can define them as optimization goals for our organizational systems. Then uh, at this stage, we probably find out that some types of adaptability are needed, but not only those, maybe uh, some additional specific uh, um, capabilities, organizational capabilities are ne necessary. This is the way for you to tailor for the unique context of your company. You might have uh, some specific constraints, people-wise, um, geography-wise, technology-wise, whatever. So you probably will uh, discover that you need a very specific uh, kind of organization in your specific context. But adaptability, normally, if you are pursuing uh, agility, then yeah, some of types of adaptability will be needed. As soon as you decide on your optimization goals, you can design your organization. And here, the Creating Angel organizations provide you with a very useful um, thinking uh, approach, of course. Uh, we teach about the system thinking, first of all, and axiomatic design um, in the specific application of organizational systems. Um, the important part of this is that we do it in the very beginning and everything else, when we come to the practical application, is based on the using of these concepts. So you, you, you do not just learn about system thinking, but you are applying this system thinking in the rest of the course, uh, speaking of the practical application. And uh, the what I personally like probably uh, the most about this approach is that this is not just like a project, yeah? <laughs> this is uh, almost endless story because uh, the world changes. And first, uh, your organization changes. As soon as you uh, implement your new organizational design, that is still your assumption. Nobody can guarantee this is a complex uh, system. So you might be mistaken about something and you need to measure how well your organization creates those essential capabilities that you define for your organization. You measure this and probably you adapt the way uh, your organization is uh, evolving. Moreover, with time you can discover that your strategy changes. So probably you need to do it again, reiterate on your if, for example, if your strategic focus changes, then most likely you will uh, find out that uh, completely different organizational capabilities are needed and respectively, you need to redesign your organization. So your organization evolves together with your uh, strategy. And finally, just a couple of words about uh, what we believe in the creating angel organizations, uh, the people who are involved uh, into the design of as a process of uh, agile organizations, what uh, people these people need to know and uh, be capable of. And uh, here I'm speaking not only about management, but also about agile coaches and even scrum masters, because uh, ultimately who will um, uh, help management to implement everything here? So they need to also know and understand uh, what's happening. So. Uh, definitely, we believe that they need to uh, be on the same page about what is the uh, agile organization. Yeah, uh, be aligned on the uh, organizational design uh, with a strategic focus. Uh, by the way, this is exactly the topic that we touched in this session. Um, organizational system thinking. So this is not just some abstract system thinking, but applied to the organizations. Axiomatic design again for organizations. I don't know if we have technicians, uh, those nerds like me who know about the axiomatic design. So I showed already this, this book. <laughs> so this is it. <laughs> this is quite, you know, a brick uh, of knowledge. And uh, uh, that is awesome how many years ago um, uh, uh, the design was thought about. Uh, and now we can uh, um, uh, use this knowledge for designing agile organizations. 
Um, we also believe that um, uh, these people need to know the types of adaptability. We mentioned some of those and other organizational capabilities and try to think about those in the context of their specific organizations. Therefore, we have a lot of practical uh, exercises. Flow efficiency versus resource efficiency. Well, I trust that many of you know this quite well, but guys, did you think about this from the perspective of the entire organization across departments? And uh, um, I must say that even when you uh, move from one company to another one, as quite often I do, that you discover that you look completely from different perspective. This is quite new uh, learning. What we do here, we uh, we do not just educate, but we give you the opportunity to do, uh, again, practical exercises in the mixed groups so that you can look from, um, from the perspective of other organizations at this. And also we give the uh, suggestion about how to approach, not versus, but how to approach the um, natural intent to have both <laughs> flow and resource efficiency. <laughs> um, top level of structure, guys. This is not about team level, I must say. This is about all the levels. So we start from the top level, departments or C level. What happens there? Then we uh, define the product or service groups. Uh, we define products or services for companies, again, based on examples of uh, our attendees. And also you might discover that you have not just products, but product families or service families. Um, and... Uh, we design product groups. And this is just the first day. <laughs> so again, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, second day here, but uh, the amount of knowledge and uh, practical experience that we are giving is overwhelming. Honestly, to me personally, uh, when I do this, I see how people, uh, that, that is kind of uh, eye-opening, but quite intense. So if you join us, please be prepared to hide hard work. Okay, uh, this is it uh, probably. And I would like to ask you, of course, guys, I understand that uh, you have some ideas probably about how to create your regional organizations, right? Probably something you, you, you discovered. And I do not expect that you have all the necessary, as I said, to go and just implement this. Uh, you can invent it yourself, of course, without even learning this uh, approach. But what, uh, from the what you heard about, what is the most interesting for you, and maybe most attractive? This is what I would like to know uh, uh, here. So here on this slide, we have again the stars in the bottom, and we have just five uh, aspects. Um, these are taken from uh, from the feedback from our uh, course attendees. And uh, I would like to know what would you find the most attractive or useful. So just attach those stars to some of these five uh, statements, or maybe you uh, think about something different that is not on this board. So please put this on, on the cards. And uh, I, will, I will tell you if this is uh, in, in the, in the, in the um, uh, system of knowledge. I'm not speaking about the course. You can go and just read the book, for example. Uh, or you uh, probably you cannot find this. Yeah. So if you share it uh, on the um, cards, uh, I will be able to answer. Uh, Rowan, one question to you. Uh, please tell me, are we on track time-wise? Yes. Yeah. I think you moved quite quickly right. through that. So we do have... A little time left, yeah. to say I like that um, stop endless theoretical debates <laughs> yeah i can comment on this um i experienced that this is you know this is not probably considered by many managers as uh, uh it's annoying uh i spoke to managers they saying well it's annoying your guys just theorizing and you cannot uh, find common uh, uh 
big and, and by the way that was the idea of one of the managers maybe you have uh, you don't have sh shared uh, grounds for your discussion so having the optimization goal set properly and uh promote it this is not just setting and telling once this is about promoting your optimi uh, optimization goals and ensuring that people really do this against those optimization goals and using system thinking so each time you just say yeah okay this is the solution and i expect that it works this way yeah you're probably uh, depicting this on the diagram and your opponents can tell you that from their perspective and experience in this company it does not work with this way you have fruitful discussions and you understand the positions of each other but not theorizing almost always well always ideally you speak about is it consistent with that the optimization goals so that that is amazing how you discover that you can use this always even if you disagree with these optimization goals this is your choice to still work within this organization right and then you still need to uh, make every effort to achieve that so that that is amazing you really end all the endless discussions all right all right thank you very much that is awesome thank you for contributing to this session um i i see that we've got one card here <clears throat> in your experience what uh what do you find is the most difficult conversation with the leaders in relation to your approach the most difficult <laughs> The most difficult is to get them uh, to several minutes to just explain this. <laughs> that is the most difficult. The, uh, the um, I would say that the pivotal uh, pivotal point here, when managers understand the value for them, the managers, uh, people, everybody is just people, and we have our interests. So when managers are interested in, well, not necessarily that they are, but quite many are interested in business results. So if you reach the level at which the business results are crucial and you show them quite simple, sim simple way uh, how your current framework or whatever happens inside the organization ultimately uh, hits the capability of achieving those uh, business results, you at least at, uh, attract their attention. And that is the pivotal, pivotal, pivotal point here. Next, you need to work a little bit more and more. But for me personally, the, the first is the, the most difficult because so far, you know, how you can call you, uh, call yourself. Can I call myself um, a GL coach? Nobody on top management needs a GL coaches, honestly. Nobody needs a GL. Well, th this is what I learned. So, um, you need to uh, really think about what the people you speak to are interested in, unless you have optimization goals set for your organization. Then, okay, maybe you're not interested in optimization goals, but we need to achieve that optimization goals. So this is it. <laughs> All right. And we also have another question. Um, I suggest, well, as soon as we don't have uh, many uh, cards uh, being uh, filled uh, simultaneously, maybe you just speak up. Uh, can you please uh, explain your question? Yeah, that's me. Uh, thanks, Davis, for the sharing. Yeah, I, I know from system thinking as well, when you do the system modeling uh, to help people to understand the system, uh, to come up with some ideas like how to improve it, Usually, there will be a lot of hypothesis assumptions behind. So basically, which means even we have through the system thinking, uh, there will be a lot of assumptions say we should do this or that, we'll try that and try that. So for that, to me, to organization design, because it's like if it's a huge change with a lot of assumptions, mm -hmm. uh, it will cause a lot of risks. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, so Absolutely. What's, what, what's your suggestion to try that, I can do to ver verify those assumptions? Uh, you know. amazing, amazing question. Amazing. Thank you very much. I love it. So um, that is awesome because this is one of the first things that I am telling in my course that, hey, guys, whatever you design here is your assumption. So you need to uh, validate it. And of course, you need to make your best guess about that if you want, if you're not knowledgeable uh, well enough about some um uh, cause effect relations but uh i showed you I, I don't know if you can still uh, uh follow me but i showed you this example with these diagrams everything that they draw on this uh, model was uh, let me show you 
This is called what if modeling. So <laughs> this is just what if, meaning that what if we are right <laughs> about this model, then it goes this way. Uh, the approach to check this, uh, as always with any product, you can consider the organizational design as a product and you apply the same approach. You probably um, try to find some, uh, if you want cheap or less risky uh, um, approach or if you want to experiment and uh, validate your assumptions based on this experiment. Uh, one of the one of the practical um, uh, materialization of this suggestion, uh, for instance, if you have say ten thousand uh, people uh, uh, organization, uh, I mean not the uh, supplementary functions, but exactly those impacting the business uh, value generation, uh, and uh, these ten thousand uh, is a quite big scale. So probably you can identify one um, subset of these, yeah? say for a couple of hundred of people. And uh, this subset would be um, virtually um, um, yeah, producing some vertical slice of, of uh, whatever the company is doing. Again, I, I'm giving the analogy from, from product. You're just taking one a real feature if you want, yeah? And you try it out, some small but valuable for your customers. This is um, the approach to minimize the risk and experiment. So if you are losing, you're losing not uh, uh, the investment into the whole organization, but into a uh, very little part. Moreover, this approach uh, also uh, allows you to uh, have uh, first adopters uh, in terms of your people. So people learn about uh, what actually uh, is happening, they learn not only about the new, if you want, ways of working or organization or those rewards or uh, the people practices. They learn this all together and they also, uh, you see how uh, culture changes. Of course, if you are in, in purposeful with your organizational design, you should expect that culture somehow changes. And uh, uh, you're lucky, well, maybe not lucky, but maybe this is exactly according to your design uh, happening. And uh, uh, if this cultural change happens in the right direction, the, the, the way that you want it to change, then these people become the ones who spread this culture when it comes to the broader uh, agile adoption, if you want, or broader implementation of your ideas, of course, with tweaks after the learning on these small. So, Experimenting is one of the most uh, powerful uh, ways of uh, checking. Unfortunately, um, of course, I can come to you and say, hey, guys, I know for sure that from my experience, uh, this is the cause-effect relation for sure. But I, I probably I would lie because each company has uh, not just different uh, structures and all these elements, but people. <laughs> And uh, in the combination of all of these people, we have so huge uncertainty about how will they act as a result of organizational changing. So I can just assume, I can add only the pro probabilistic, uh, probabilistically improve your chances, but still you have some risk, yeah? So anyways, I would suggest to try something with smaller um, risk experimenting. Uh, by the way, I, I'm not sure if I, mentioned this, but in our approach, well, to me personally, it's obvious, but not to every company, that you need to involve people from different uh, layers of your organization because you need to learn about your organization and whatever uh, happens here, you will maximize your chances of coming as close to the optimal state as possible if you learn about your organization at its maximum, yeah? So those people can help you. But therefore, of course, important <laughs> that they need to be interested in bringing their uh, knowledge, not faking their knowledge. Uh, I'm trying to say that sometimes management invites these people and people don't feel safe. So this is the whole uh, another topic for another discussion, guys, honestly. But uh, in general, involve uh, people who, all the people who know about your organization, proof about your organization, and uh, go through experiments. Is that okay, Mike? 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I know this is quite a big topic, but uh, yeah, I appreciate that. That's definitely. I believe the experimentation would be the king. Uh, of course, like uh, how to breaking down this big design to small experimentation. Uh, that that would be very. As large, as as Danny mentioned, that will be a large uh, conversation about that. But yes, I, I believe that, uh, that would be the way. It, it, guys, if you come to um, um, Agile Australia 24, uh, I will, will be there and I will be speaking there. So if you find me, we can have a chat. So see, easy. All right. And Anthony, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, thanks. Um, so let's say my question is, kind of relates to post experimentation. Uh, okay. So now we've got a, um, a sy systematic change, perhaps, that we want to spread. And I can see how we might encourage adopters and all that, like we do with other continuous improvement or change management. But it seems like um, what you're proposing, yeah, thanks for bringing up that one. That's just right. As, as we uh, implement and measure and go back to strategy, because perhaps we're changing capabilities that we want and we, we want to restructure, it sounds like this is something that doesn't die after the first consultation. It has to keep occurring. Now, given that being the context, just imagine I'm in a particular business unit and um, these system changes take place over time. Now, there's a danger that I'd, I'd suffer from... I'd suffer from too much change coming down that I, I, I don't ease, easily know what it's for. And I wonder about, you know, like we might make a small change somewhere and it only has a small change in a particular business unit, but I'm going to get that coming along. It's going to arrive in my business unit. They're going to say, oh, it's a little bit different this week now. We've got a new approach. And then a month later, we get something not dissimilar. And so I'm just just wondering how we can um, help the organisation adopt this in the long run to cope with the change that comes through the system as yeah. a result of this. Do, do you have strategies to help uh, with that? Thank you for for question. I will try to answer as, uh, 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 as well as I understood the question because it's, uh, yes, to me personally, it's oh, not just yeah. one question, it's several ones, okay? Yeah. So first, I completely agree with the fact that uh, you cannot change uh, organizations continuously. <laughs> Just because everyone will be overwhelmed and not understanding what happens. Uh, it's it's quite quite hard for people and many mm -hmm. people just hate this change. So you will have any resist uh, a lot of resistance. Uh, our suggestion is this. Um, appreciate the fact that your system is quite uh, has inertia. Meaning that as soon as you apply some changes, Nothing changes right away. Uh, it takes time for the change to be understood so that people understand what are the new boundaries. Oh, okay, how can I find? They will experiment them, them themselves. We are experimenting. We are adapting to new reality of this organization. So it takes different organizations, different dynamics, but from three to six months probably to only see the outcomes of this change. So it does not make any sense to change completely and continuously as soon as you don't learn from this. Again, this is quite a gel approach, you see. So you first need to learn what the, uh, what uh, it led to. And this is three to six months at least, but again, depending on the organization. And then you understand, aha, uh -huh, okay, now we see uh, this progress towards our desired um organizational capabilities. Now we need to understand how well people are ready to the next move. Because if this change is positive in general, and if people feel relief, better certainty about what happens, they see value in their work, if engagement of people improves, et cetera, et cetera, sometimes they are ready for the next change and even demand the next change if they understand what could be the next change. So you need to uh, to feel your organization. Therefore, you need to, those uh, people from those different levels to be involved <laughs> into your discussions, into your considerations. So this is the first uh, statement that you need 
to give it the time to learn from these first. And second, you need to be accurate whether your organization is ready for the next move. It also depends on the criticality because if you made a change and it, I give you example, uh, a framework uh, was adopted and the framework was adopted quite well consistent with the optimization goals. It fit quite well. Uh, everyone starts working. Everybody is, you know, energized and people like it. But uh, time comes and um, uh, annual performance review is in place. <laughs> so they changed the part of this organization. They changed more than just a framework. They also adopted, uh, they changed the departments, uh, they changed the product management, line management, et cetera. But they did not change one tiny one part, part reward, reward system. system. So sure. this uh, leads to suffering. People really hate this organization because guys, we half a year we spent on this. We were so energized. We we put uh, we did um, extra mile to really get uh, some business value delivered, and now you are evaluating us based on the uh, uh, oh, old values. Yes. Yeah. So in this case, this organization made a decision to know not wait, but to fix the problem right away. So they just. Uh, ab they just abandoned all this uh, for this cycle. So they said uh, no evaluation uh, right now, just no evaluation at all. Yes. Everybody was happy. So I'm just giving example that there's again, no uh, silver bullet here. You need to uh, be conscious about what you're doing. Organization is huge and complex. People are in this organization. They normally hate changes. Um, but also I uh, remember that you mentioned uh, some unit is changed. We suggest as you remember, system thinking. System thinking promotes holistic approach. So yes. if your uh, unit is not a separate one uh, working with the rest of the organization based on the principles of internal uh, economics, like, you know, well, maybe this is uh, not the best idea to change one unit, not changing the surroundings because surroundings will hit. I have another, another example from Portugal. I will not uh, tell you the name of the company, but that, that was a, a child company of a big corporation. And this child company, it, it was like, you know, we are a separate company. We can do everything. No, guys, <laughs> you are just yeah. a child. <laughs> I was thinking more so, of the adoption process within that unit rather than hmm. not the participation. Um, based on your answer, um, it would seem that maybe a concept of an epoch or something could take place where you you implement these changes, you let them filter through, you get them established, you get the um, performance metrics aligned, etc. And then after a certain period, you go, okay, well, now that that's all bedded down, we can see it's creaking in a few places. Let's declare a new epoch and we'll say, we're going to go and, and revise the system a bit more maybe change some of our wanted capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. And this is, hey, a new epoch, guys. Don't worry. Don't panic. It's going to work like the last one. <laughs> um, I would even go further uh, from this, the, what you explained. I would even make it like, hey, guys, let's analyze this together. Yeah. yeah. Get people on board. And so that they come to this solution, to this yeah. understanding that they need the next iteration to achieve that um the target state of their organizational capabilities yes yes of actually, course. actually make them ask for it yes yes well ideally they should ask <laughs> you, you can you, you can find the respective techniques to, to come to this as a coach of course but uh one, one one caveat here by the way some organizational changes are heavier than others right so some low level details might be even given uh, for self managing teams they can do it right away immediately some of those are again low level so if you ensure that everyone makes decisions based on, on your optimization goals then some um elements with light effect or localized effect mostly they probably may be changed uh, more dynamically so yeah. it's yeah on case by case basis. Thank you. That's a very good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony and Dennis. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to balance the depth we go into with any other questions. If uh, any of you are sitting there going, just want to get uh, one one small question in before we wrap up. Does anyone have anything you wanted to just ask briefly? Let's 
think we've had very in-depth kind of conversations about a couple of pieces there. I've got to say, I was uh, really excited to see the Orca XL Canvas examples, Dennis. Um, just in a nutshell, would you say that's a, a tool for once you have like optimizing goals, like having a structured approach to like, how, would, how would you kind of frame like what you're really doing with those Orca canvases in a, in a 60 second? Well, Orca yep. canvases is a supplementary tool that uh, that is not part of uh, creating agile organizations or designing agile organization course unless you come to my course, just because I use this tool, I invented it. Mm. Uh, so that, that, uh, that is uh, another uh, way of just diagramming and uh, keeping your uh, complex system diagrams and uh, organizational system diagrams are quite complex usually uh, in a well-structured way. This is it, nothing else. So you can return to it and much easier uh, uh, recall what happened because sometimes you have just uh, one, two hours right now and then next day it's quite hard to remember what was the discussion. So this is just a tool, nothing else. You can use another tool and approach um, but uh, I use it because I, it's just uh, my way of thinking. I'm a very structured person and I'm critically thinking. So whatever happens, I'm first asking why do I need this, etc. So I just like transparency and this is it. Um, the this tool uh, has a very specific section here. Thank you for mentioning this, by the way, Ron. Uh, it has this optimization goals section, 